It's the Real Estate Podcast, brought to you by ANZ Home Loans for financial well-beings. And welcome to another episode of the Real Estate Breakfast, available on iHeartRadio every morning and on Spotify and Apple and wherever you get your podcasts from. Well, the weekend has arrived. The week went pretty fast. Uh, the 29th day for October for 2022. Yes, another weekend across Australia. And good luck if you are endeavouring with any property chasing dreams this weekend, whether you're buying or selling. Coming up, if you are buying, Andrew Wheatley is back talking all things mortgages. And in particular, he's going to be looking at deposits because a lot of first home buyers get confused with this. And Andrew is going to break all of that down for you this morning. Now, if you're in regional Victoria this weekend, the increasing rising prices there has come to an end. Domain reported that the property boom in regional towns like Ararat is fading out. Prices are still higher than a year ago in every local government area and outside of Melbourne, but Domain says the last three months the growth has stopped. Regional Victoria's overall median house price fell by 1.7% to 575000 in the September quarter, and that's kind of significant because it's the first fall since March 2019 quarter, and it brings to an end Regional Victoria's strongest upswing ever and also the highest total amount of listings are on offer since March of last year, which of course is giving buyers much more choice to choose from. Informing you every morning from 6.30, seven days a week on The Real Estate Breakfast. As mentioned, we're going to be talking about mortgages very shortly, but if you're celebrating your birthday today for October the 29th, you are sharing it with Winona Ryder. She is turning 50 today, the big 5-0. And Kate Jackson, I was quite surprised. Now, if you're old enough to remember the original Charlie's Angels, you'll know exactly who Kate Jackson is because I think every man across Australia in the 70s was in love with her. She's turning 73 And on this day, back in 2011, a bit of a dark day, Jimmy Savile died, the English radio and television host. And if you haven't seen the Netflix Jimmy Savile, a British horror story, I'm not sure whether you should. I mean, he's just such an evil, evil man and got away with so much criminality. In fact, that Netflix documentary was quite scary on just about every level. We talk with leading property commentators with analysis, predictions, forecasts and what's trending every morning from 6.30. It's the Main Centre Forecast with PRD. Selling smarter every day. And around Australia we go. Let's check on your weather on this Saturday morning. Firstly in Sydney, expecting sunshine today and a high of 26 degrees. In Melbourne, expect one or two pieces of rain. 17 is your forecast high. Blue skies and sunshine with 31 in Brisbane. And in Perth today, the showers to ease and your top of 19 degrees. It's your weekend real estate breakfast, a serial-sized podcast about what's happening in your local backyard every Saturday morning on The Real Estate Podcast. Well, first home buyers, they have waited a very long time to see the market slowing down. The hot market has been a problem for them to get into their first property. However, the biggest problem most face when applying for their first mortgage is saving a enough of that damn deposit to buy the home that they want. But is the solution to this deposit dilemma in the information signalling? Meaning, is there a lack of information about the many different ways a bank will accept deposits? That's one question. And the other is the old 10 to 20% deposit that mum and dad would bring in is just one of many different ways to get the deposit together. So let's find out a little bit more about all of this from Andrew Wheatley, the owner of the mortgage business Wheatley Finance. And a very good morning, Andrew. Welcome back to the Real Estate Breakfast. Thank you, Craig. Happy to be back. 
So as mentioned, Andrew, the market has slowed, but the deposit is still the big problem to solve for first home buyers. That's true, Craig. If you haven't carefully looked at all of the different deposit options available, and there are 12 of them, with five that are the most common, there's a really good chance that it's going to cost you a lot of money, time or stress later on. Now, I'll give you a good example. Two years ago, I was talking to a young couple, Molly and Jer, they just started looking at property to buy their first home. They had enough savings already to put down about 10%, but that would leave them no money left afterwards. So it's not a, it's nice to buy your first home, but it's not a great feeling when you move in and your bank account's empty on the first day because Murphy's Law, something's going to break straight away. So their goal was to save some more money, maybe save for about another year, try to get closer to 20%, have a bit more cash and look to buy. When we went through the process of the deposit checklist I used to go through all those different examples, what popped out is that there was actually a government scheme that they weren't aware of that would allow them to purchase with a 5% deposit and pay no mortgage insurance. So it was the perfect solution. It allowed them to go ahead and buy straight away. They had enough money left over to put in a new kitchen and bathroom straight away and still have money left over for a rainy day. Now, a few weeks ago, we actually revalued that property they bought two years ago, and it's gone up by $125,000. So by using the correct deposit method, the outcome they got was that they were able to buy sooner, they made more money, they paid less fees, and they could get by putting in the minimum amount available, and they had that cash left over. That's the goal of properly going through a process of understanding the right deposit options. Yeah, that's a great outcome. What are some of the examples of deposit options that first home buyers may not be aware of? I think there's two that really pop to mind, but the main one that I think is the most underused deposit strategy is guarantors. It used to be more popular back when I was younger to to date my age, but it got a bit of a bad rap back in the 80s. I think there were just some unscrupulous practices, but that isn't the case anymore. It's really well regulated and parents are really well protected. Again, look, I'll give you a good example. Actually, a property that just settled yesterday, a home for some clients of mine, Peter and Lucy. Literally six weeks ago, we had our first phone call when they were trying to suss out where they stood. And it was really obvious after we went through that, again, that process of the deposit checklist, that they had plenty of income. Income wasn't their problem, but they had quite a small deposit and they were never going to be able to purchase what they wanted. They were probably looking at least 12 to 18 months of savings. And what popped out in their case was that they had a set of parents who were just perfect to be guarantors. So we all had a chat about it, explained how it worked. Everyone was on board with it. And they were literally buying a property about a week later and and it's just settled. The difference of, again, being able to purchase now and not pay rent for another 12 to 18 months, you know, the parents are delighted because they've given their kids a leg up. They're in the property earlier. It's just such a big win-win all around. Yeah, that is so true. And there are advantages of knowing the right deposit method before a buyer applies for a mortgage. So perhaps let's just step through some of those. Yeah, well, again, it all relates back to picking the one that's going to allow you to put in the minimum amount of cash needed with the minimum costs and that's going to allow you to buy the quickest. One mistake that is really commonly made is the idea that you have to put in all of your savings. There can be a lot of advantages in being able to hold money back. Look, a really good example of this would be some other clients of mine, Ben and Andrea. They had a huge deposit. Like they were just amazing savers. Like I was in awe of them. They'd saved up hundreds of thousands already as a young couple to go towards their property. They could have put in like a 35% deposit for what they wanted to buy. And when they contacted me, that was their plan. Like just in their head, they're like, well, don't we just have to put all of our money in? When we talked about it more about their future plans, they were having planning to have a baby in the next year or two. The property they were buying, they were probably going to need to upsize it in about five years. So what they were buying now was probably going to become an investment property and they'd actually be buying a bigger family home about five years from now. So in their case, again, what popped out of that deposit process checklist we use, we used a lender that allowed first-time buyers to put in a 15% deposit, pay no mortgage insurance, and they were able to hold on to the rest of that cash, which is now one going to be money there while Andrea goes off on maternity leave. They can now afford for her, instead of having to go back to work after six or eight months, she can take a couple of years off if she wants to. They've got heaps of cash in the bank. 
And then when it's time to upsize, they've got this huge cash deposit sitting there to go towards the new purchase, leaving a larger investment loan behind, which has some tax advantages I won't won't go into here. So again, understanding the right deposit strategy to use up front has massive advantages later on and not understanding it, you can just leave a lot of money on the table. Yeah, and having money in the bank, it just gives you so many more options. And talking of the options, what are some common mistakes that you see first home buyers make with their deposits that can be avoided? The one I see the most is this fear or the stigma around paying lenders mortgage insurance. You would swear that no one in Australia has ever paid mortgage insurance before because all everyone talks about is, you know, don't pay it, don't pay it, don't pay it. The better way to put it is, if you can avoid it, absolutely try to avoid it. But what you really need to weigh up is, how much is the cost of the mortgage insurance and how long am I going to have to keep renting for before I would save up enough money to be able to avoid it? I've had plenty of um, clients, uh, look, Tony and Louise are ones that spring to mind. I think they purchased about 18 months ago. Uh, They had a 10% deposit. Their plan, again, was to save up more to not pay mortgage insurance because their parents were telling them don't pay it or their friends are saying never pay it. But when we weighed it up, in their case, the mortgage insurance was going to be about $10,000. The property market was red hot. Waiting 12 months was probably going to cost them about $50,000 in the price that the property they wanted was going to go up by, and they were going to be paying rent for 12 months. Once you lay it out like that, it's like, pay the damn money, get the house now, get in the market, and it's done. They did, and they're delighted they did. I'm not saying try to pay mortgage insurance, but open your mind up that sometimes it's worthwhile. And just quickly there, Andrew, let's talk about the different ways first home buyers can use various deposit options available to them and which ones might suit them best. I guess to give an idea of the process, what you want to do is first off, be aware of all of the different ones. And you're really just going through and first of all, ticking off which ones are just impossible for me. If your parents don't own property or you just know that there's no way they would want to be guarantor or there's no way you'd ever want to ask them, well, that one just gets across through it. And you go through all the different options one by one until you see, well, which ones are possible? And then out of the ones that are possible, which ones are going to match up best to your goals? I mean, it's a relatively simple process once you've got the information in front of you. It's just really important to not get locked in to, I guess, that sort of old fashioned thinking of, you know, it has to be 10% or 20%. There is a wide variety of options, and if you don't check them out, quite possibly it's going to cost you a lot of money. Andrew, you are a school of information when it comes to mortgages. We'll leave it there. I'll let you get out and enjoy your Saturday morning. And once again, thanks for coming back onto The Real Estate Breakfast. My pleasure, Craig. We connect you to the best real estate information across Australia. The Real Estate Podcast. 